Hi friends, Father Kerry Walters here, pastor of Holy Spirit American National Catholic Church, and this is another Holy Spirit moment. This one on the remarkable witness, the remarkable martyrdom of a saint who many people have never heard of. When he died in 1889, the British poet and Jesuit priest Jared Manley Hopkins left behind a number of unfinished poems, and in one of those poems there is this stanza. She held her hands, too, like in prayer. They had them out and laid them wide, just like Jesus crucified. They brought their hundred weights to bear. They killed Jesus long ago, God's son. These, though they did not know, God's daughter, Margaret Clethero. Margaret Clethero is the saint of whom I speak. She was one of the so-called English martyrs, those priests and laypersons who were killed for holding fast to their Roman Catholicism during the reign of Elizabeth I. Elizabeth I, of course, established the Anglican Church, and at the beginning of her reign, uh, in 1558, um, the anti-Catholicism was more or less tempered, but as the years rolled along, and more and more unsuccessful conspiracies against Elizabeth were discovered and often attributed to disgruntled Catholics, the laws against being a Roman Catholic got harsher and harsher until by the mid-1580s it was actually a capital offense to either be a Roman Catholic or to harbor a Roman Catholic priest or, of course, to be a Roman Catholic priest in England. Part of the reason for the harshness of these laws was a bias against Roman Catholicism. There's no doubt about that. But I suspect that a greater reason for these harsh laws was this. To be a Roman Catholic was considered to be an act of treason because the assumption was Roman Catholics would have their first allegiance, not to Elizabeth, not to Parliament, and not even to England, but to the Pope. Now, Margaret Clethero, born in York, in 1556, uh, was a Protestant for uh, over half of her life, as a matter of fact. Um, she was born into a middle-class family, what we would today call middle class. Her father was a candle chandler. Um, he died when she was around 11 or 12, and her mother remarried again to a merchant who was squarely in the middle class. When Margaret was around 14 or 15 years old, she married a much older widower named John Clithero. He was a um, uh, abattoir merchant, a butcher, uh, in a street in York called The Shambles. You can still visit their home there uh, today. Um, and when she was 18 years old, she converted from Protestantism to Roman Catholicism. It's not at all clear why she did that. The person who wrote her biography shortly after her martyrdom, a person, John Mush, who was a priest and her confessor, doesn't really give us much of an idea of why the conversion took place, but it did take place. Now, her husband, John, remained a Protestant, although he had two brothers who were Catholics. One of them was actually a priest. And John Clethero, the husband, seems to have been willing to turn his head away from his wife's Catholicism, to tolerate it, as it were, because he loved his wife. After she converted, Margaret became what was known as a harborer of underground priests. She let it be known that priests who had been smuggled into England would be welcome into her home for a few days' rest, would be welcome there to celebrate Mass, and she even rented a room in another house to harbor priests as well, all of which, of course, was considered to be, again, by the mid-1580s, uh, treasonous. She also hid in her home uh, priestly vestments that the visiting priests would wear when they celebrated Mass. Now, she was known as a recusant. A recusant was a person who refused to attend Anglican services. Recusant is a uh, derivative of the Latin verb for to refuse. At the beginning of Elizabeth's reign, to be a recusant simply meant that you had to pay a recusancy tax. It was a small bit of money. 
um, that was the penalty for not attending Anglican services. But as Elizabeth's reign uh, continued, the recusancy tax got more and more stiff until ultimately it was absolutely unpayable for most people. Until in 1585, uh, being a Roman Catholic was declared to be uh, a treasonous act. Well, Elizabeth, uh, I'm sorry, Margaret herself um, was um, fined uh, the recusancy tax on more than one occasion, a uh, tax with her, which her husband John willingly paid. And she was actually, as the years progressed, imprisoned on three different occasions. The final time she was in prison, she appears to have given birth to one of her children, her son. But she really didn't get into trouble until 1585 and 1586. It was during those months that she sent her son abroad to the University of Louvain to study under Jesuits. Now, whenever an English kid suddenly disappeared, the authorities got suspicious that he was being groomed for the priesthood, and they would immediately investigate. And this is exactly what happened in Margaret's case. The authorities came to her home to question her about why her son had disappeared, and while they were there, they discovered the priestly vestments that Margaret had hidden. And they also found a youth, not one of her children, who uh, testified against her, saying that she indeed did harbor priests, that she was a secret Roman Catholic. Well, she was immediately arrested, and she was tried with breaking the anti-Roman Catholic laws, which in effect means that she was tried, uh, that she was charged with pre uh, treason. At that point, Margaret Clitheroe had some choices before her. She could plead uh, either innocence or guilt and take her chances in a trial. She could recant her Catholic faith, or she could remain silent. She could refuse to plead. Now, she knew that if she pled innocent, she would still be found guilty because it was clear that public sentiment and the sentiment of the authorities in York were against her, and so she would die. She would be hanged. She wasn't about to recant her Catholic faith, and so she chose to remain silent. She refused to plead. However, she did so knowing that that, too, was a death sentence, and this is why. It's quite remarkable. It strikes us today as barbaric, and it is barbaric. In Elizabeth's England at that time, if you were charged with a crime but refused to plead one way or another, that was considered to be an obstinacy that was simply beyond the pale. And so you would be executed for your silence. And the mode of execution was quite horrible. You would be laid flat on the ground, face up, and a board, usually the door of the accused person's home, would be laid on top of them, and then weights would be added slowly to the board until the person was crushed to death. It's a horrible way to die, much more horrible than hanging, uh, which was the penalty for treason that Margaret was looking at. Why did she remain silent? I think there were two good reasons for her overall martyrdom, and one of them explains her refusal to plead her silence. The first reason, of course, was her deep fidelity to God and to the Roman Catholic Church. She was not going to recant her faith. She was not going to betray the faith that had kept her uh, enlivened and vitalized. That just didn't enter her mind. But the second reason was this. She knew that if she pled one way or another, her husband and her three children would be questioned by the authorities and would perhaps be implicated in her crime. And if they were implicated, they would face the same ultimate penalty that was facing her. And she did not want to implicate them or in any way cause grief to fall upon them. And so she remained silent. It seems to me that this is quite remarkable. It's unique in the history of the English martyrs. Most of these martyrs died because they clung fast to the Roman Catholic faith and, and, and resisted the governmental pull to become Protestant. Think of any number of them, like Thomas Morris and John Fisher. Well, certainly Margaret resisted the anti-Catholic laws, but she also wanted to help her family, even if it meant a horrible, horrible death. 
So her martyrdom, like all martyrdoms, was um, embraced out of a love for God, but it was also embraced out of a love for her family and the desire to protect them. She was kept in jail for 10 days. The authorities refused to allow her to meet her husband or children during that time. She had the opportunity to sew her own shroud. Her confessor came to visit her a couple of times. Um, another clergy person who, interestingly enough, was a Puritan, came to visit her and tried to get her to recant her faith so that she wouldn't be um, martyred. But she replied to him in this way. It's a, it's a beautiful encapsulation, it seems to me, of the double motives for her witness. She said that she loved God and would never betray God, but that she loved her husband and she loved her children, and she would just as soon betray God as she would wrest her paps, her breasts, from her children's mouths. So her love of God and her love of family were just inextricably and intimately bound up with one another. On the day of her execution, March 25th, 1586, she was marched out to a bridge over the River Ouse, which ran through York. She eventually was laid flat on the ground. She tried to put her hands in the prayer position. That's what Hopkins was referring to in his unfinished poem about her. But instead, the authorities pulled her arms out on either side so that she lay in cruciform. They put upwards of 800 pounds on top of the door that she was lying under. Her final words were, Jesu, Jesu, have mercy on me. It took her about 15 minutes to die. The weight crushed her, disfigured her, um, opened her chest, broke her ribs. And after her death, they put her off that night and buried her in a secret place because they didn't want Roman Catholics venerating her relics. Her body was eventually discovered by Roman Catholics about six weeks later, and they gave her a Christian burial in a site that is still unknown. I have a real tender place in my heart for Margaret Clitheroe, a woman who loved God but also loved husband and children enough to die for them, and not just die, but to die in one of the most painful and gruesome ways imaginable. The in the pressing to death. That was the favored punishment for people who refused to plead. Margaret was known to be a woman of some beauty. Jared Manley Hopkins recognized that she possessed a great deal of interior beauty as well. And in that same unfinished poem about her, he writes this. The Christed beauty of her mind her mold of features made it well. The Christed beauty of her mind, of her soul, of her interiority shone through, not only in the beauty of her physical form, but more especially in the beauty of her act of martyrdom, her showing of fidelity to God and her deep sacrificial love for her husband and her children. St. Margaret, pray for us that we likewise can grow the interior beauty that you so exhibited in your lifetime. I'm Father Kerry Walters. This has been another Holy Spirit moment. If you enjoyed it, I invite you to think about subscribing to the Holy Spirit Moments YouTube channel. God bless. I will see you next time.